Acts 19, and we'll start reading at verse number one. <clears throat> and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to Call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men, and they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for this text that's before us this evening as we consider when Paul came to Ephesus and how he didn't come alone, but the Holy Ghost was with him. Lord, we're so thankful that everywhere we go, you've promised that you will not leave us nor forsake us, you said, lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. And Lord, I thank you for that promise and for your enduring, abiding presence. And I pray, Lord, tonight that the Spirit will just be working in each and every heart that's here tonight. If there's someone that's not saved, I pray that tonight they'll be saved. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help each one of us to be more like our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. There's a missionary that I know and you've heard of. He's been on our prayer list for a little bit. His name is Wes Bartley. He's a missionary to St. Lucia. And in St. Lucia, they actually, uh, some people actually call him the miracle man. You say, what in the world? Why would they call him the miracle man? Well, the story goes like this. From what I heard, there was a man in the streets of Denary where, where they're ministering who was demon-possessed, a man that was, you know, not in his right mind, not acting normal, and they practiced witchcraft down in those parts, and anyways, this man was lying in the middle of the road and refusing to move, and, and nobody could talk to him, nobody could get close to him, nobody could get anywhere near this man, and so Brother Wes Bartley, he goes up, and he just read the Bible. <laughs> he prayed, he prayed, 
he, he simply just spoke, just, he read the scriptures to him and he just kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it until finally the man just got up and walked away and everybody was just watching. And I don't know anything about it, whether or not the man got saved or anything like that, but everybody was standing by and they said, how did he get that man to move? How did he get that man to go anywhere? You know what it is, don't you? It's that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. There is a spiritual world. There are demons. There are, there are false spirits in this world. But for Christians, we have the presence of the Holy Ghost. There is a man by the name of A.J. Gordon who tells a story of a Welsh preacher who was scheduled to preach one night. And he was asked to be allowed to withdraw for a time before the service. And he remained in seclusion. And, and someone was sent to his house saying, why in the world hasn't he come to the service yet? And he gets to the house and he's about to knock on the door and he hears the man and he's talking. And he, he doesn't, he feels like he's hearing a, a conversation by two, from two parties, but all he hears is one side of it. But the man saying, I will not go unless you go with me. I will not go unless you go with me. And so without interfering, the conversation that this person was hearing, they returned and reported to the people that sent them. He said, he'll come all right. And the other will come too. He's not coming alone. And well, sure enough, when he came, the other one came too. Who was the other one? It was the Holy Spirit of God. And they say that meeting, when he went to preach, there was a wonderful service, and many were saved because the Holy Spirit went along with him. In our text this morning, or this evening, we see Paul going to Ephesus, going to a place where a place that was steeped in paganism, steeped in idolatry. Ephesus is famous for its temple to the goddess Diana. It's a city that's steeped in Greek mythology and Greek idolatry, a city where everybody was idol worshipers and demonic in their worship. But Paul, you say, how could Paul go there? How could he face a city like that? How could he go up against such a foe? Oh, he didn't go alone. The Holy Spirit of God went with him. And when you read Acts chapter 19 and you read of Paul's ministry in Ephesus, you realize that it wasn't done by the power of Paul. It wasn't done by his own, his own boldness or his own, his own strength or his own ability. It was done by the power of the Spirit of God. It was a demonstration of the Holy Ghost and power. And this evening, as we look at this text, I want you to see the Holy Ghost ministry. This text shows us all the way through, as we read these verses, we see the Holy Spirit. We see how he works in the world today. We see the difference that he makes in our hearts and lives. And so tonight, let's just consider as we walk through Acts 19, 1 to 17, is as far as we'll go, let's consider the Holy Ghost. I want you to see number one this evening, the mark of the Holy Ghost. The mark of the Holy Ghost. How do you know that you're a Christian? How do you know that you are in fact saved by the grace of God? What sets a Christian apart that makes him different from all those around him? Is there any way, is there any markers, any proof that you're a child of God? I'm glad you asked because there is one. The Bible points us to a marker. It's the Holy Spirit of God. How do you know that a person saved? It's that they have the mark, they have the seal of the Spirit of God, the seal of the Holy Ghost on their life. You think this evening, you look at this text, know this, you're not a Christian without the Holy Ghost. You're not. You might be a good person. You might be religious. You might have a wonderful reputation. You might be a leader in a synagogue or in a church. You might be held in high esteem. But if you don't have the Holy Ghost, then you're not a Christian. You're not a Christian at all. The text begins with this wonderful truth that every single person who is saved, who is a Christian, has received the Holy Ghost. 
In Acts 19, when Paul enters Ephesus, we read in these opening verses how he, met, he meets people that you and I would meet, and we think that person must be saved. They must be Christians. I mean, they have a, a, we have, they have a common friend that we have, a, a man that we, we know his preaching, and they knew his preaching. They followed that man's preaching. It was John the Baptist. They had been there when John the Baptist was preaching, when John the Baptist was baptizing by the River Jordan. These men had been baptized with that baptism of repentance. Those men had turned a new leaf. Those men had turned their lives around. They had started walking the straight and narrow road. Everyone looking at them would say, those are God's people. Those are religious people. Those are saved people, you would say. But Paul, on meeting them, realizes that there's something missing. There's something that they're still lacking. And he asks them in verse 2, he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any, re, any Holy Ghost. They thought they had salvation, but they didn't have salvation because they didn't have the Holy Ghost. They didn't actually have a relationship with God. Paul knows right away that these men are not saved because they've never received the Holy Ghost. Because the Bible teaches us that every single person that's saved has received the Holy Ghost. This is what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 9. It says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Then verse 14 to 16 of the same chapter says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if you're a Christian, and you've got to have the Spirit of God, there's no substitution. There's no alternative. If you have the Spirit of God, you're saved. But if not, you're still lost in your sin. And in the text, we see these men having religion without a relationship. We see these men, they have works, but they don't have reality. To them, it's dead. They've turned from their wicked works. They've been enlightened in the things of God, but they have no knowledge of God. No knowledge of him who's, whom to know is life eternal. You know, there's many people in the world like that today, isn't there? Could that be you? Could it be that you have, you come to church, you, you do the works, you do the best you can, but do you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you? Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Does Christ dwell in you, the hope of glory? Do you have a personal relationship with him? You say, oh, I don't know. I, I never knew any of this before. Well, listen to this. You say, how do I know that I have the Holy Ghost? It's simple. There's one truth that, you, that is true of everyone that has the Holy Ghost. It's that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So I don't know if I have the Holy Ghost. Well, let me ask you this. Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? That's when it happens. As soon as a person believes on Christ, he's indwelt. By the Holy Ghost. In fact, the Bible tells us that you can't believe on if someone someone can't be a can't believe on the Lord on the Lord Jesus Christ without being indwelt by the Holy Ghost. The two go hand in hand. You read that in this text. Paul says to them, "Have you received the Holy Ghost since when? Since he believed." And they say, "No, we don't know if there is any Holy Ghost." They explain their situation. They were baptized unto John's baptism. And Paul says to them on verse 4, Then said Paul, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. He told them the name of Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. You are you're a Christian when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you're not a Christian without the Holy Ghost. You're not a Christian without believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. What was the distinguishing factor with these men that they had not received the Holy Ghost? It was that they hadn't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, you can tell that they're saved in the text because they spoke in tongues. That's how you know they were saved. No, they were saved because they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You do find a few times in Acts where someone received the Holy Ghost by the laying on of the apostles' hands. The, 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 that was a, a sign gift given to the apostles to confirm the word as it was preached, that something that happened with the apostles in that time. But now the word of God has been confirmed. But the Bible is clear to us. Every single person that believes is sealed, the Bible says, with the Holy Spirit of, with, with the Holy Ghost. Uh, we're sealed onto the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit of Christ. And it was their belief. That's what it was. They hadn't received the Holy Ghost because they hadn't believed on Christ. But once they believed on him, they received the Holy Ghost. You know, so many Christians, you know, we get concerned over texts like ours tonight. There are some that build a whole doctrine around Acts 19 verses 1 to 7 and say, now listen, if a person is to be saved, they need to be baptized and they need to come up out of the water speaking in tongues. And Brother McLeod, if he was here tonight, he'd testify of how when he was baptized in a church like that, they, uh, they just kept dunking him. <laughs> they just kept bringing him back down under the water until they were thinking, fine, one of these times you got to come up and speak in tongues. And that way we'll know that he's got the Holy Ghost. We'll know that he's saved. And he said, I didn't feel nothing. But finally, he said, if they're going to drown me, if I keep, keep doing this. So the seventh time, he says, or something like that, he, he rattled off something to get them to stop doing what they were doing. But because some believe that that's an evidence of salvation. And while the tongues was given in the New Testament times, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that there would be a day when tongues would cease. Literally, they'd stop mid-sentence. Tongues were given for a sign. It was a way of confirming the word as the apostles took the gospel around the world at the beginning. But Hebrews 2 verse 3 tells us that the word has been confirmed. And so tongues have ceased. There's no more need for that demonstration, that specific way of confirming the word that's preached. And no, what makes the difference isn't whether or not a person has some supernatural experience. What it is is faith. What it is, is is belief. Do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the Bible says, if you believe on him, he's indwelt you with his spirit. 1 John 4, 13, hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. Our faith isn't built upon our feelings. It's not built upon some supernatural experience that some might have. Our faith is built upon this book right here, the Bible. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit indwells those who believe, indwells those who confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that's where our faith is. And every single Christian has received the Holy Ghost the moment they believe on him. That's what happened with Cornelius, you remember? We always talk about, you know, we, we preach a message and we give the invitation and we want someone to come forward and make a decision to trust the Lord. And oftentimes they are led to the Lord when they make that decision. But really a person saved as soon as they believed. Paul was still speaking, or Peter was still speaking. Sorry, not Paul. Peter was still preaching to Cornelius. 
when the Holy Ghost came on him because he believed at the words that were being spoken of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you have the mark of the Holy Ghost? There's the mark of the Holy Ghost in the text. Secondly, there's the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. We see all the way through this chapter, the Holy Ghost showing himself, revealing himself in lots of different ways. We see the work of conversion, how these men come to know Christ as their Savior. Uh, you know, we saw, see in the text how they spoke in tongues in this text and prophesied. But the fact is, when a person is born again, there's always going to be some evidence. There's always going to be a change in that heart and life. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, oftentimes, the biggest change that you see is the smile on the face. I think of a man that they called Sunshine Harris. An American evangelist says that the meanest old cuss I ever ran into was named Sunshine Harris after he was converted. This man would curse God and curse you. I used to say to him, you're about the age of my father and I love you. And he'd turn around and spit in my face. He looked like the devil with apologies to the devil. Well, one night he went to the mission and cried out, oh God, if you can do it, save a man like me. And he was converted. His face lighted up with the love of God, so they came to call him Sunshine Harris. He'd come around and ask me if I could ever forgive him, and I'd assure him if I did. And the next day, he'd come and apologize again. He did the rounds of the saloons and restaurants, asking everybody to forgive him. How do you describe that? That's the Holy Spirit making a change in someone's heart and life. That's the work of the Spirit of God, the work of conversion, as he, as he makes men and women new creatures in Christ. These 12 men in our text, they became new creatures. As Paul preached in Ephesus, there were many souls being saved, many souls being converted. How does that happen? Through Paul? No, that's just through the Holy Ghost. That's through God working in men and women's hearts. We see his work is man, manifested through conversion, but secondly, He's manifested through conviction, conviction. You know, sometimes you preach and you might say, or you might witness to someone and you say, I don't see any evidence that God's at work there. I don't see, I don't see that person getting saved. I don't see them any closer to accepting Christ. I don't think anything's happening there. Well, usually you can tell that God's still at work. How do you tell? Often it's the fact that they're resisting. It says in the text that, in our text, that Paul then goes into the synagogue and for three months he disputes and persuades the things concerning the kingdom of God. It says, but when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. He starts there. And, you know, I, he would have hoped that those, especially in the synagogue, they have the, the scriptures. They'd have a knowledge of the Messiah to come. They, they really should have been ripe to hear the preaching of God's word and to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. But instead, they Instead, they spake evil of that way before the multitude. You say, How's, what's going on here? They're resisting the Holy Ghost. That's what's happening. God's working in their hearts. God is at work. God is trying to, is working to convince them of sins, to reprove them, to rebuke them, to show them the way, to show them his love, to show them the way of salvation. But like they did when Stephen preached. They resist. Stephen said to them in Acts 7.51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. They resisted his preaching. You know what I love about this? 
This just leads to all of Asia hearing the gospel. Paul leaves the synagogue and he rents a school, the school of Tyrannus. Many believe that Tyrannus was a Jewish, uh, a Jewish rabbi, a Jewish scholar who believed when Paul preached. And he let Paul use his space so that he could preach the word there. And all the students would come in here and people would come from all over Asia. And they heard the gospel. It says in the text that all they that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And you know what happened? Churches were founded all over Asia. You read Revelation chapter 2 and 3, and our Savior writes a letter to, the set, to each of the seven churches of Asia. And you say, well, I read the book of Acts, and I only find Paul going to one city in Asia. I only find him going to Ephesus. I don't ever read of him going to Thyatira or to Pergamos or to Sardis or to any of these other cities. I only read of him going to Ephesus. When did he go to all of these other places? And when did they get saved, become Christians? You don't know? It's right here in our text. It's right now. When Paul is in this time disputing in the school of Tyrannus, people from all over Asia, from Laodicea, from Pergamos, from Sardis, from Philadelphia, from Thyatira, from Smyrna, they're all coming into Ephesus and they're hearing the gospel preached and Paul's taking it or it's being taken all over that Roman province and souls are being saved. Churches are being planted. Everything's going out from right there in Ephesus. You know, Paul was in a hard spot. He was facing opposition but the word of God wasn't bound. Souls were still being saved all over as a result of that ministry. And so it is today. Sometimes we might think that, you know, we're, we're having a hard time. We're having a, strug a struggle to reach the lost, but God's still at work. Souls are still being saved. The fact is the reason why Jesus hasn't come back yet. The only reason is because souls are still being saved. He's long suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And as long as the souls are, there's still more souls to be saved. That's why he has delayed his coming. It's the work of conviction. He's still convicting men in this world of their sin. There's the work of conversion, the work of conviction. And then number three, the work of confirmation. Verse 11 and 12. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. In the book of Acts, there are two, uh, two apostles that we see a lot of miracles. It's Peter and it's Paul. Philip did a few as well, and I believe all of the 12 apostles, or yeah, 12 apostles, I believe Matthias included, would have been able to, would have wrought miracles in their ministry, but we only are really told, the, the plot line only really follows Peter, Philip, and then Paul. But we see how God worked miracles by him, how people were healed, how diseases went out of them, evil spirits went out of them. And you say, well, why doesn't that happen today? Well, it's because those were given to them to confirm the word. We mentioned it earlier. Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following, amen. As the New Testament apostles went throughout all the world, God confirmed the word with these signs. And God proved, it was his way of showing the Greeks seek after wisdom, the Jews require a sign. It was God's way of showing to them that this is his word. This is the truth. These did happen. So there was no doubt that God was speaking. And did you know that? Yes, we know we don't have the sign gifts today. 
but God still confirms his word. And if you're wondering about the truth, if you're wondering about, about the things of God, he can still show you. He'll still show you that it's real. He'll still show you the reality. You don't believe me? Just come and find out. The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. Just try it. Try. Just, just seek him. The, the, the Bible says that he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And he still confirms in hearts today. It's the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. 1 John 5, 10, he that believeth on the Son of God hath a witness in himself. 1 Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And Christian, don't wonder about your salvation. God's put his witness within you. Now, the fact that you're here tonight, the fact that you believe and confess Christ, the fact that you, do, that you want to do what's right and are seeking to please the Lord, where do you think that comes from? I can tell you where it doesn't come from. It doesn't come from the devil. It doesn't come from the world around you. It doesn't come from your own flesh. The Bible says it is God that worketh in you, both to do and to will of his good pleasure. It's a manifestation of the Holy Ghost. He converts, he convicts, and he confirms. And then one more truth tonight in that. Uh, see how we do. Number three, we have the mark of the Holy Ghost, the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. And then number three, there's the matchlessness of the Holy Ghost. You know that you cannot duplicate the Holy Ghost. You can't conjure up something that's just as good. You can't counterfeit it. You can't duplicate it. What the Holy Ghost can do, no man can do. No spirit can do. It can't be copied. You read these opening verses, and Paul has done some amazing things, but not by his power, but by the power of the Holy Ghost. And in the last verses of our text, we find that there are men that want to copy that power. They're the sons of Sceva. They are men that, uh, men that are Jews who are vagabond Jews, uh, men that are void of knowledge, void of religion, void of faith in the Lord, but they have this occupation. They say that this is their occupation. They are exorcists, they say. They say that they can cast out devils, cast out demons, and I'm sure they have lots of traditions and lots of demonic things that they try to do to conjure up the devil and to get the devil out of an unclean spirit. But obviously, they don't have much success because they're still looking for how to do it. <laughs> but they hear what Paul's done. They hear how Paul has cast out devils, cast out these evil spirits. And they say, well, let's just do that. Let's just cast out a devil in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. The only problem was they didn't have the spirit of God in them like Paul did. They didn't have God working with them like Paul did. They didn't have the relationship with the spirit of God like Paul had. And so we read in the text how they go up and fight against this devil, try to kick out this evil spirit. They say, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. But the devil says to them in verse 15, the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I know. But who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus and fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. They thought that they could get rid of the devil through their own spirit. They thought that they could duplicate the spirit of God, that they could by their own power, or by their own means, have the same kind of victory that only the spirit of God can provide. 
but they found out that you can't duplicate it. God's power cannot be matched. It cannot be rivaled. It cannot be copied. And friend, how many religions are there out there that try to counterfeit the real thing? Try to counterfeit it. Just because someone says the name of Jesus doesn't mean that they're a believer in the name of Jesus. Doesn't mean that they're saved. These men said Jesus' name, but they weren't saved. They didn't have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet they thought they could duplicate his power. And perhaps you're here tonight and you've been trying to find a way to rid yourself of the burden of sin. You've tried churches. You've tried traditions. You've tried following spiritual leaders. And you've heard some say, listen to me. I'll rid you of your sin. I'll free you from that unclean spirit. I have a process that I can take you through. I have some works that you can do to be clean. I have some rituals that you can subscribe to. Follow these traditions. Pray to these saints and you can be rid of your sin and Satan's dominion. And you follow their rituals and their traditions and their legalistic rules only to still be fighting the same battle. Never to be rid of that burden of sin. To never have the victory that's offered in the word of God. What you need is the spirit of God. What you need is not the arm of the flesh, but God's spirit working in you. You're not going to win the battle just by the arm of the flesh and saying the name of Jesus. You're not going to win the battle by just striving to be different, just by trying to change your nature by yourself. What you need is the spirit of God. Yield yourself to his control. First, become a Christian. First, ask the Lord Jesus Christ to dwell in your heart to save you from sin. And then walk in him. Read the Bible. Follow it. Live it out. Pray. Learn the power of prayer. Learn the power of the word of God. As you pray, as you read the word, the Holy Spirit, he'll help you. He'll give you the victory. He's able to do that because after all, it's something that only he can do. It's not something we can do on our own. The Holy Ghost worked in Ephesus, and a great church was started. And you know, what we need today isn't what man can do. It's not a counterfeit. But what we need in our church and in our city and in our own lives is the real thing. We need the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Ghost working. We need the Holy Ghost power. And the wonderful thing I see in Scripture is this. We have that. It's available to us. The Bible says in that text in Mark 16 that they went the Lord working with them. You know that he hasn't stopped working with his people he said, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the world. The same Holy Ghost that accompanied Paul to Ephesus accompanies us today here in Halifax. He accompanies us everywhere we go. He hasn't left us. He hasn't forsaken us. And his power has not diminished. We just need to go trusting him, not in our own strength, not in the arm of the flesh, but go in the power of the Spirit of God. It was E.M. Bounds who said, what the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more novel methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use. Men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. Are you a man or a woman whom the Holy Ghost can use. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for this text that we considered this evening. Lord, we see Paul go to Ephesus, and we see the Holy Ghost at work, and how he made all the difference in the world. Lord, I just ask that we'll go in the power of the Holy Ghost. I ask, Lord, that we, will, um, that we won't go in our own strength and try to conjure up with our own power what only you can do, but I pray that we'll put our trust in you, and that we'll let you be our strength. And we'll realize that it's when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. When we learn to go by the strength of the Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we'll be a church that 
as a real witness in our city to the grace of God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.